what are you thinking in terms of next steps? And I mean, are you looking at any kind of continuous monitors where you already have like a, a what is it, a whoop or a yeah? <laughs> but but are you looking like a CGM or a or a ring? But actually, if you've got a whoop, probably don't need an aura ring, but like a CGM. Yeah, so I've used I've used a CGM. It worked great for two or three days, you know, like stuck in my arm, no problem. I got nice, you know, glucose spikes and all those, you know, um, none of my blood tests, uh, my uh, blood glucose levels went above 120. Yeah, and that was, you know, remember I eat in a pretty compacted window. So even with a lot of food in a relatively short amount of time, I didn't see any spikes above 120. And in the published literature above 140 is when you start to get into, I guess, uh, pre-diabetes range. So less than 120, it was good there. And then uh, <laughs> I bumped into the wall and that messed up the sensor. So I had to take it out. And then I put another one in and I started getting wacky readings, like blood, blood glucose readings of 45. So I took that out. I called the company. They sent me a new one, plug that one in. I had issues again with, with getting, um, uh, normal readings. I wasn't getting normal readings. And then when I pulled it out, I noticed that it stuck half in my arm. And these things are, you know, when you, when you use a sensor, you know, you, it's, you, you, you basically, uh, it's, you push on it and it clicks when it's in your arm. So it's almost, you know, I hate to say idiot proof. It's idiot proof, right? I'm, I'm not, there isn't anything I have to do other than push it hard enough where it clicks and it clicked. So that, that was two or two um, that didn't work. I couldn't get them into my arm properly. And I think I may have tried a third one and had the same problem with like blood glucose readings of 45. And then uh, I called the company and, and they were going to send, I think they sent me another sensor, but I was so frustrated that, at that time that I stopped using it. But I got really nice data for a few days and I actually saved that data in case I ever make a video uh, in terms of, you know, the spikes and, and what I was eating during that time. I tracked everything very detailed, but um, yeah, I, I think the CGM is valuable, right? Uh, but, you know, especially, especially for things that you wouldn't consider that could possibly give you a spike. Like uh, there's a study that was published, I think, from the C uh, Seagal lab, uh, Eliab and Seagal, where they looked at the, the blood glucose response to uh, white bread. Um, and everybody didn't have a glucose spike after eating white bread, which is literally uh, simple carbohydrates. So, you know, may, I, I didn't see it in my data in terms of any, you know, big spikes. As I said, everything was below 120. But, um, you know, there may be people who, who see, uh, you know, I don't know, 160 or for whatever they're eating, whether, whether it's oatmeal or something else. Um, maybe they change their diet because of it. So for that, I think it, it brings a, a lot of value, at least to do it you know, for a two week period or however long you can get it to stay in your arm where you're testing all of the foods that you normally eat. Uh, yeah, I think for sure it offers, uh, it offers value, but also note that I wasn't eating, eating any junk food. I was eating my standard diet. Right. So if I ate junk, I'd probably, I'm guessing, I mean, I, I was speculating, right. But I probably would have seen some, some spikes, right. If I had the Nutella peanut butter mix on the day of my blood test, I'd expect to see a, some, somewhat of a spike. Right. And so, okay. In terms of the future, I mean, apart from so not CGM, are you thinking of any other like enhancements to your protocol? Well, the, the, the future is, is, um, making it so crunching the numbers faster. The time limiting step is, is, uh, generating the, the correlations and looking, you know, like I said, linear regression models, you know, so adding a few variables into a predictive model for a given biomarker that takes time. Right. So autom automating, um, you know, this process where, you know, I get the blood test data, I have the diet date, diet data. And then, you know, so now I have, uh, well, the big picture biomarkers are, you know, 20, 20 something, uh, markers that I regularly track as, you know, overall markers of systemic health, but the CBC gives me, you know, 40, uh, you know, it gives other stuff too, that I'm not, uh, paying close attention to with the goal of optimizing. Like for example, you know, your sodium levels, your potassium levels, phosphorus, chloride. I mean, these are things that are generally pretty stable unless you have, you know, advanced kidney disease. So, you know, uh, is it worth playing with my diet to optimize those two? I, I don't think so. So I try to focus on the bigger picture, which would be kidney function in that issue. Right. So, um, so I've got, you know, these 20 or so big picture biomarkers and then, you know, 40 or so macro micronutrients. And then I've got probably another 60 or 70 foods. So I'm looking at correlations for all of that. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, probably a hundred correlations or so for each blood test. And that doesn't even include the biomarkers versus other biomarkers correlations. So now you're looking at another 20 or so correlations. So 120 correlate, that just takes time. Right. And even for clients that I work with, 
you know, generating the correlations and then uh, uh, coming up with recommendations based on that data in terms of macro and micronutrients and what food amounts you should eat based on how the data says, right? Um, that, you know, I have to look at everything carefully. So that takes time, right? So um, automating that process where it isn't, you know, about a five to seven hour analysis time from the time of blood test to analyzing the data to deriving the plan that will carry me forward for that two month period for the next blood test, automating that so that it can be, you know, much faster would help, uh, would not just help me, but, you know, imagine if I can juggle instead of uh, three or four clients, if I could juggle 20, now I'm helping 20 people improve their health rather than three or four. And then extrapolating that onto a bigger scale, if that can be automated, you know, now it's not 20 or 30 in a company we could do, you know, hundreds or thousands or more. So yeah, automate, auto, automating is definitely on the list getting towards the machine learning approach towards all of this, having enough data and then having an algorithm that's good enough to um, make predictions. And even if they're terrible in the beginning, just every time we blood test and every time you would have more of your own data, the algorithm should improve. And just as tangent on that note, you know, there are companies and I won't put them on blast right now, call them out by name, but there are companies that, that offer, you know, one blood test will tell you what to eat or one stool sample and will all tell you what to eat. And I find this nonsensical. I mean, you know, I have, like I said, up to 30 blood tests. It's still a work in, work in progress because as I mentioned, we're not mice in a cage where you change one variable and, and then, you know, you would still need five to 10 blood tests with that one change where you put it in, you take it out, right? So maybe 10 blood tests. So, you know, for companies pre, you know, existing companies now that offer you dietary optimization based on a single blood test or a single stool sample, whether it's based on population averages or even your own data, it's nonsensical. So, so the future is coming up with auto automation, uh, you know, AI slash machine learning approaches. I don't know when that will happen, um, uh, but I'm hoping that we do get to that point. And then even taking it a step further, even better would be, you know, a smart toilet or some kind of phlebotomy, you know, approach in my own house where um, I can kind of test all of these things. I mean, the, uh, the blood test generally that I'm getting, you know, the standard chemistry profile and the, and the complete blood count CBC that's done on, on a, uh, you know, a pretty standard device that's been used for decades. I mean, I think it's about a hundred, a $500,000 device. So, and most people don't have a demand for it and usually demand drives production. And, you know, the more things that are produced, the more people that have demand, eventually the price comes down like phones, you know, like right? So uh, prices come down because we all want one, right? But I don't see the demand for a $500,000 uh, device to measure all these things that I measure. I don't see that coming down in the future where we all have in our homes. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Some people send me links all the time of companies that are deriving some of these things, whether it's only for glucose or only for cholesterol. But again, I want more of the picture, right? So ideally I'd have something like this in my house where you know, uh, have somebody draw my blood because me drawing my own blood can be dangerous. What if I mess up? And even, even though it's not hard, but, you know, I have a friend who does this on her own and she, she's had problems with, you know, sticking her vein. And anyway, that's another box of uh, can of worms, but uh, yeah. So you have to have someone come in. I mean, there, there are more steps that, uh, you know, uh, um, introduce, you know, time and effort, but having something like this in my house, whether it's a smart toilet or the phlebotomy kit, you know, the machine, the $500,000 machine, that would speed all of this up potentially, right? I could look at this on a day-by-day -day basis, even adding another layer to this. So um, I, I, all of my blood tests that I've done on purpose have been when it's not after an exercise day, you know? So obviously I want my best blood test data. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to fake anything here. I'm, I'm very honest with how I do it, right? But I want my, blessed, bl my best blood test data. Now, if I do a full workout and don't eat too many calories or whatever the variables may be on the day before a blood test, I may not have very good blood test data. So all of my data has been um, mostly on non-exercise days before my blood test. Now, that said, what does my blood look like the day after a blood test? And I can tell you, it probably isn't good because at least using my, you know, um, these metrics, you know, heart rate variability and resting heart rate, my worst data is the day after a workout, which you would expect because exercise is hormesis, right? You, you stress yourself so that you have, you know, your body is temporarily weakened, but then it builds itself up to where it can, you know, resist, better resist that stress over time. So I have yet, and, but this is on my list, 
you know, rather than only looking at fully rested, uh, not overtrained data for blood tests, eventually adding in, you know, what does my blood test data look like only after, you know, my vigorous workout days where I've done a full, you know, weightlifting and all the other things that I do. That's a separate analysis, right? You know, and if I didn't account for that, my data would be confounded, right? I'd have all this data. Maybe I'd have 15 blood tests that are quote unquote rested and 15 blood tests that are overtrained. It would make it more difficult to interpret, right? So I've standardized it for one way, but there is another. So anyway, uh, that's on the future list there. Um, but in, in terms of the, you know, the smart toilets and, you know, uh, uh, you know, you poo, and then it gives you a readout of maybe what your diet would be uh, along those lines. It's, it's, just a means to get more data more quickly. Uh, but we would still need, you know, the, the analysis and the interpretation. Um, so yeah, all of that is, is on the future list. Right. That sounds yeah very interesting. And I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah. I mean, cause you always get your blood tests done like in a fasted state and when you're rested and yeah. At some point, at some point, I definitely want to do that though. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's also something about uh, physical activity optimization, right? So what's the optimal intensity and the optimal duration where you get that hormetic effect while also maximizing fitness, but not overtraining. And the reason I raised that issue too, is because, you know, so in animal models and even in human data, exercise increases uh, life expectancy um, in particular for humans, right? So in an animal data, it extends average lifespan, but exercised mice don't uh, get to their maximum longevity, right? So one could argue that there's something about exercise that's good for average lifespan, but also limiting it doesn't in that it doesn't get you to the maximum or, or uh, beyond. For me, that's not good enough. When I think about exercise, I think I should for sure get to the maximum lifespan because I'm actively trying to improve my fitness and fitness should lead to the longest lifespan. So uh, by tracking, you know, these cardiovascular metrics, uh, I actually see a window of an average daily exertion that may be optimal for me. And it's, it's actually not what I would intend or what I, what I would expect. I'm kind of like a gorilla. I like throwing heavy stuff around for hours at a time, but that absolutely destroys my cardiovascular health metrics the next day to where I had to reduce the uh, duration and intensity of my workouts to where they're intense, but not as long. So, and along those lines, imagine if I'm chronically doing that over a long period of time, I'm burning my nervous system out, you know, using it in simplistic terms. And maybe that's part of the reason why you can increase your average lifespan, but not get to the maximal. So that's also along this, uh, you know, so that's definitely on my list is this blood testing after, uh, only after the exercise day, or maybe in, you know, I'll have, uh, you know, one month where I'll blood test on the rest day and then exercise and then go do the other arm, you know, uh, you know, prick this arm and then prick this arm the next, you know, two days later or whenever it may be and, and uh, look at them in separate columns.